episode, I speak with professor of medicine and nutrition and author Luigi Fontana. Key points addressed were Luigi's core components in his book titled The Path to Longevity, in which he outlines key puzzle pieces to longevity and argues are core to living a lifestyle that prevents disease and promotes a healthier and more fulfilling life. Stay tuned for my fascinating talk with Luigi Fontana. My name is Patricia Kathleen, and this series features interviews and conversations I conduct with experts from medicine and science to health and humanitarian arenas in an effort to explore the world of fasting from a variety of angles. This dialogue is meant to develop a more complete story about the information, research, personal stories, and culture in and around the science and lifestyle of fasting. If you're enjoying this podcast, be sure to check out our subsequent series that dive deep into specific areas such as founders and entrepreneurs, vegan life, and roundtable topics. They can be found on our website, patriciacathleen.com, where you can also join our newsletter. You can also subscribe to all of our series on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Podbean, and YouTube. Thanks for listening. Now let's start the conversation. Hi, everyone, and welcome back. I am your host, Patricia, and today I'm sitting down with Luigi Fontana. Luigi is a professor of medicine and nutrition and author. Welcome, Luigi. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. I'm excited to climb through uh, your book as well as a lot of the things that you speak about. For everyone listening, you can find out more about um, Luigi Fontana. On um, He has several YouTube videos and he's also present on Facebook, but just by si- searching his name, L-U-I-G-I-F-O-N-T-A-N-A, Luigi Fontana, you'll be able to pull up all of those pieces of information and research him more fluidly. I will offer you a quick bio on um, Professor Fontana, but before I do that, uh, I'm going to offer a quick roadmap for the line of inquiry in which today's podcast will follow. As promised, I will read a bio on uh, Professor Fontana, but before doing that, or after doing that rather, I will define, uh, ask him to define some key terms uh, speaking to the fasting industry and um, the world of it that he may or may not be using and how he himself defines them either in his literature or um, just personally so that we can kind of unpack terms that might seem rote to um, certain individuals. However, I think it is imperative in helping one explain and explore how fasting is being looked at and examined. We will then turn to unpacking um, Luigi Fontana's book. Uh, It's titled The Path to Longevity, and um, it has some core components within it, um, uh, jigsaw puzzle pieces that uh, Professor Fontana actually um, ascribes to longevity, and I will want to look at some of those key aspects, as well as um, the audience, how the book was composed, if the audience that he intended for it to be towards was in mind, or if he was just writing towards his research. Then we'll wrap the entire podcast up with rapid fire questions for those of you that have written in and would like some questions posed to people in Luigi Fontana's particular expertise and field. So before I start peppering him with questions, as promised, a quick bio. Professor Luigi Fontana is an internationally recognized physician scientist and one of the world's leaders in the field of nutrition and healthy longevity in humans. His pioneering clinical studies on the effects of dietary restriction have opened a new area of nutrition-related research that holds tremendous promise for the prevention of age-related chronic diseases. His research has delivered a paradigm shift in the understanding of how dietary restrictions, restriction by slowing the accumulation of metabolic and molecular damage deeply influence human aging biology and the in, initiation, progress, and prognosis of many clinical conditions, ranging from obesity to type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and cancer. So he was a scientific member of the Board of Directors for the American Aging uh, Association from 2014 to 2019. And since 2016, he's the editor-in-chief of Nutrition and Healthy Aging and associated editor of Gerio Science. Um, So you guys can, everyone can look him up. Um, Luigi, before we climb into the book and a lot of the core tenets, I was hoping that you could further unpack the work you've done, why you chose to, to focus your expertise and your, um, the labyrinth of education that you've acquired based on um, aging or uh, de-aging, as it were, and um, fighting disease. 
Yes, so this is a very good question. Look, you know, uh, while I was studying medicine and doing my residency in internal medicine in Italy, I realized that, you know, practicing medicine for the rest of my life just by treating disease that typically develop after many, many years of an healthy lifestyle was not good for me. I, I wasn't happy. And so my interest was how can we prevent, you know, diseases? How can we stay healthy for as long as possible and enjoy our life? And so I started to search who were the scientists that were working on, on these topics. And uh, I found out that, you know, John Holodzy uh, at Washington University in St. Louis was one of these scientists. I wrote an email to him and I said, you know, uh, I'm interested in, in, in nutrition, exercise and aging and uh, slowing of aging, prevention of diseases. Can I join your lab? And he replied to me and said, yes, of course, you know, just come. And so I, I prepared my luggages. And after a couple of months, I got, you know, the visa and, uh, and I left and I went to St. Louis in Missouri, where I spent the last 17 years of my life before I moved to Sydney. Interesting. So what was, what was the impetus for moving to Sydney at that point? Uh, were you still continuing with postdoctoral work? What were you working on? No, no, no. I was already a professor at Washington University. I was a professor. I have been a professor for many years. I was a professor of medicine and the co-director of the longevity program with John Holodzy. Well, John died and uh, we had a very strong relationship. And uh, I thought, you know, it was a good time for me to move, you know, to leave to leave St. Louis and to move in, 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 a, in a different country to start to, to start a, a new project. And at University of Sydney, they have launched a new multi-center initiative on trying to address uh, chronic disease like obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular disease and aging itself from a broader perspective, not just, you know, concentrating on one intervention, but, you know, as we understand aging, aging is, has multiple components and try to tackle such a complex phenomenon with one intervention is not gonna work. And so I think, you know, the approach that, you know, we are designing and developing here at the University of Sydney is pretty innovative and uh, there is great support and um, so that's why I decided to, 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 to move. And apart from that, Sydney is a beautiful town. It's, it's a fantastic, beautiful weather, beautiful beaches. You know, it's like living in California. It's, it's really, really nice. Yeah, it is. I was actually in Sydney when the pandemic broke out filming and had to come home. But I have lived in Australia um, in my past, and it's Sydney's a, just an amazing city. It's got metropolitanism. It's also clean. And as you said, the weather, it's, it's quite lovely. And I love all the water that surrounds it. It's, it's lovely. Um, I'm yeah. curious. I want to look at unpacking some um, key terms. And um, it's not necessarily meant to be a dictionary definition or a medical definition, but rather your own personal definition as you use and employ these terms, um, either throughout your book, The Path to Longevity, or um, just in your writings or even in some of the lectures that you might be involved with. And the first key term I would like to have you define for everyone listening so that they can kind of understand what you're referring to when you use it is just simply the word fasting. How are you defining this term? Well, fasting technically means not consuming food, just water, uh, but there are different definitions. So if when we work on animals, you know, we have different form of fasting. You know, there is the alternative fasting or intermittent fasting. There are now the 5-2, there is now the time restricted feeding, so there are different forms and different definitions, but let me clarify that right now there is, I think, and there are unsupported claims from some scientists that are working on animal models 
and they are basically relating the findings in these animal models to humans as if as if mice for example or rats were similar to humans but they are not let let me make an example so a, the great majority of of mice strains mouse strains they die after 48 hours of fasting because the, the metabolic rate of mice is very is very fast typically mm -hmm. a mice a mouse lives two and a half years. Humans live 80 years. Again, as I said, you know, most strains of, of, of mice, they die uh, after 24 hours of uh, water only fasting. Humans like me, that I'm pretty lean, I can go for a month without eating and I'm not gonna die. So right. when we interpret the data from animals, we have to be very careful because when we, when we look at the data of intermittent fasting in animals, so one day you eat, one day you don't eat, that similar to five days of water only fasting in humans and five days of eating, five days of water only uh, fasting and five days of eating. So I think, you know, we have to be very careful when we interpret the, the animal data. Absolutely. And I don't think that um, it's encouraged that anyone without expertise and even those with, as you're talking about, interpretive values, association versus causation, correlation. Um, we need to be very, very careful jumping yes. from species to species. Um, how would you define, you use those uh, five two. How, how are you defining that word? It's, it's in reference to um, eating versus not eating. What is the five two? Look, the five two was a, a commercial a commercial operation that resulted from a, a documentary from that was uh, called the eat um, eat fast and live longer produced by bbc by My michael mosley and i was one of the two main uh, characters of this documentary and so basically Michael Mosley came to see me in Washington University and he interviewed me and Walter Longo in California. And after that, he launched the documentary and he had a book ready called The 5-2 Diet that became very successful, but without any scientific support. Basically, he took some of my signs in, in color restriction in humans, some of uh, Walter Longo's signs in animals and he put together this, this documentary with this book that was very successful, but the science behind the fight to die in humans, it's very, very weak. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So how do you feel about the documentary then? Since the science, I mean, you, some of your testimony was used to back the premise of it. Do you think it was worthwhile as a documentary or do you believe that um, it should have had more science backing it? Well, I feel that I don't know how to, 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 to say that, you know, but I think, you know, you know, that too many people, they are looking into magical thinking to some easy fix for complex problems. As I'll try to, as I, as I try to describe in my book, you know, aging and the prevention of the accumulation of damage with age is very complex. There are multiple factors and uh, try to use a simple mean like fasting that don't get me wrong. I mean, if you use fasting properly, it has his own benefits, but, he, it, but it has also the potentials for damage. So I think, you know, we have to be very careful when people, they embark, you know, in prolonged fasting or intermittent fasting without changing their lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, that, you know, this documentary, again, fr from a commercial point of view was fantastic, no doubt about it. You know, I think, you know, like from what I heard, you know, that he sold millions of copies and, 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 uh, and is very trendy and he launched a trend. Uh, in fact, you know, after the documentary, I received, you know, 
hundreds of emails saying, you know, fantastic job, Professor Fontana, you know, that's fantastic. You know, I've started, you know, the 5-2, I've lost a few kilos and I'm happy. But, you know, we have unpublished data on a 5-2 diet where, in my case, the definition of 5-2 diet in my study is not 500 calories or whatever you want. So the definition of the 5-2 diet is five days a week, you eat whatever you want, two days a week, you eat 500 calories of whatever you want. Mm -hmm. So my definition of a healthy fasting should be five days of a healthy Mediterranean diet and two days of vegetables, non-starchy vegetables only, okay? So that's mm -hmm. the definition of a healthy fasting, of a healthy diet. And, uh, and in this study that, you know, we haven't published the data yet, what we are finding is that people that eat five days of whatever they want and two days of a vegetable fasting, in my study, people, they were allowed to eat non-starchy raw or cooked vegetables at libitum, dressed with two tablespoons of olive oil and vinegar or lemon, they basically had uh, uh, a nice reduction in body weight we're talking about you know seven percent body weight over six months but most importantly what we saw is that many of the metabolic benefits that you know we typically see with the classical color restriction were not uh, occurring so basically the composition of the diet in the non-fasting days is influencing the metabolic response, the weight loss response uh, in a non-significant way. So okay. suggesting that there is an interaction between the composition of your diet that determines the composition of your gut microbiome and the response to a similar reduction in body weight. Yeah, and you draw this out, you draw this kind of um, symphony of, of pillars out in, in your book's um, kind of core jigsaw puzzle pieces to longevity. You talk about um, genetics being, you know, one of the key, and then calorie intake, protein intake, uh, photochemical vitamins and probiotics right there. I'm assuming you're getting into the gut and things like that. And then you talk about sleep, physical exercise, and the last two being um, cognitive training and um, medications. And um, uh, I'm curious, I have a couple of areas I want to, I, I, I agree with the, um, the premise, and obviously I'm sure your research does as well, but that there's multiple factors into consider, you know, um, fighting disease. And um, a lot of people, you talk a lot about in some of your speeches on YouTube and things like that, that genetics are not just necessarily a, a, a nail in the coffin moment, that it's, it's only a piece of the puzzle and that we're not just um, a, a destined to play out our genetic propensities as far as disease and then um, longevity is concerned. Um, I'm curious how you came to write the book. So at first, when you were looking at your audience, was it intended for your academic community? Was it intended for lay people? Who were you writing this for? No, it was for lay people. Uh, you know, I, I thought, look, you know, my salary as a professor of medicine has been paid out of tax you know, people paying taxes, you know, to support our research, you know, our, our, our professions. And so I said, look, uh, apart from communicating my results to uh, colleagues in scientific meetings or with papers that are very technical and people they cannot understand, I thought it was a good idea to try to translate into simple words what I've learned in the last 30 years of clinical practice, because I'm a clinical practicing physician, uh, my research at Washington University, 20 years working in one of the best universities in the world, you know, with a team of fantastic scientists and colleagues uh, like John Holodzy, Samuel Klein, and many other ones, and all my interactions 
being, you know, one of the top leader of healthy longevity in humans, I've been invited to, to give talks, you know, to major university and meetings. So I know very well, you know, the field and I know who are the major actors in the world, scientific actors in this field. And so I said, you know, I want to make my point because I don't like, you know, this uh, simplistic approach to a very important topic like healthy aging, like healthy longevity. So meaning how can we stay healthy where, you know, someone says the, the solution is uh, uh, fasting, someone else says is exercise, another one says is vegan, the other one is paleo, the other one says, you know, so there is the, these kind of wars, you know, this fighting between different mm -hmm. scientists. And I think, you know, the answer is uh, neither one, it's a combination that depends on, on your genetic background. So we know that probably 20, 25% of the risk of developing cancer, of aging faster or, 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 or slower, and cardiovascular disease is due to our genes. On, I'm talking in general. Then, you know, if you have a specific mutations of a specific, specific genes, that is a different story. But I'm talking about the average population, the studies, the twins studies uh, are telling us that 20, 25% is due to the genes we are inheriting and 70, 75% is due to the environment. Now, the beauty that what we are finding is that certain metabolic factors, so how much uh, liver fat you have, how much fat you have in your liver, how much exercise you do that determines your glucose tolerance and your liver fat and your triglyceride response, your inflammation, uh, your level of inflammation, uh, how you sleep, all these factors are determining the response to a similar diet. So if you give uh, 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 the same food, you know, for example, a, a, a piece of bread to two different person, the response is different based on these parameters that I have just mentioned. So the idea, you know, there is a diet that is that is uh, that is good for everybody. It doesn't make sense from what we have learned in the last in the last few years. Mm -hmm. And we have to understand, and that's my point. We have to understand the the major drivers of these metabolic pathways that are inhibiting or promoting the accumulation of damage so that you know we can tailor our intervention but if we don't understand this mechanism basic mechanism we are just basically uh, following fat diets or extreme exercise interventions that can be damaging our body right and so i'm wondering how do you ascribe to the utility how does your book kind of promote a utility of you're talking about developing a bespoke understanding of one's own unique biology because everybody does not receive, as you've said, even just the, the reception of a sandwich the same. And so how do you um, advise people go about understanding their own particular um, anatomy and physiology? Is there is there a simple way to do it? I mean, it seems very, very complicated, almost laboratory-like to kind of develop this understanding of how people respond uniquely to specific aspects that will inherently affect these metabolic factors that you're talking about. Look, you know, again, it's like if you ask me, how can you become a doctor? Or I ask you, how can you become a, a, a highly qualified journalist or like, like you are? It takes time. It takes understanding. It takes, you know, you know, it's like, how can you learn, you know, to practice yoga or karate or playing a violin or, or a piano? I mean, you know, if someone is, wants to, to have a simple answer to something that takes time to digest and understand, you know, they are wrong. And that's what, why I wrote this book, you know, because a lot of people, they like, you know, this magi magical uh, paleo, vegan, fasting, uh, exercise, mindfulness as a simple recipe for a complex problem. It's like if you ask me, 
how can I become a cardiologist? You have to study, you have to understand. And so what I try to do with my book is to tell to people, yes, it's complex, but it's not difficult if you want really to understand, if you want really to make a, a change in your life, you, if you want to maximize your health and you want to drastically reduce your risk of developing disease so that you know you can enjoy your life, you can enjoy your, your kids, your grandkids, your grand grandkids, you want to promote your health, the health of your kids, you know, because what we are understanding is that what we do even before procreation is shaping the epigenome of our kids and grand and grand grand kids for generations. And so we are predisposing them to developing, to have a higher risk of developing diabetes, cancer, cardiovascular disease and cancer. And so people, they have to understand there are certain biological mechanisms. And I tried, you know, to be very simple. So it's not technical, my book. I think, you know, even someone who is not a scientist can understand. And, and so I, I have been working hard, you know, with my publisher, you know, to translate my knowledge of this very technical into something that can understand someone who is not a scientist. But the message is that if you are looking for a magical pill or for a magical diet, don't read my book. That's not for you. So you, you can go out and look, you know, for one of these magical book, you know, with an easy fix recipe. But if you want, instead of to understand, it's like, you know, if you want to become a good player or a good karate uh, or whatever you want to do in life, it takes some effort to understand the basics and build on these basics. So then, you know, you, then, you know, you become uh, proficient. Yeah, I want to get into a couple of core principles that your book mentions that I think a lot of um, books don't draw out. Um, and it, uh, so of these kind of eight puzzle pieces that you talk about to longevity, you, um, you differentiate sleep and meditation from cognitive training. And I'm wondering if you can um, talk about those terms as far as you're using them and why sleep and uh, meditation are clumped together and then what you mean by cognitive training and why it's also not lumped with sleep and meditation. Look, you know, as always, you know, when, once, when you want to try you know, to, to explain things, you know, you have to divide them in, 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 in topics, otherwise it becomes too complex, you know. So cognitive training means that what we are finding is that, you know, as we get older, uh, people, many people, especially in Western, in Western countries, for metabolic reasons, they start to develop uh, cognitive problems, memory issues. And there are studies showing that one of the components that is driving this cognitive impairment is the lack of cognitive training, meaning that you know, the, our brain is like a muscle. So if you keep exercising, you're gonna keep your muscle mass. If you stop exercising, everybody knows that, you know, if you, if you stay in bed for a month, you're gonna lose bone mass and muscle mass. What we are finding is that you, if you don't you can use your brain by learning new things, you know, even if you are 70, 80, you know, learning how to play an instrument, even if you don't become Mozart, doesn't matter. But just, you know, the effort, you know, to try to play is important to stimulate the growth of synapses. So our neurons have, you know, this termination called synapses that connect the different neurons in a network that can be stimulated. And so that's very important because not only for cognitive impairment, to, for, for, for helping, you know, to, to, to slow down cognitive impairment, but also for our uh, well-being, our mental well-being. Because if you, if you think about it, you know, if you, if, you, if you repeat something again and again, for example, now, you know, I moved from St. Louis to Sydney, after a couple of years, now I can drive through the city because my, my memory, my synapses have learned these, these streets. So I don't have to, I don't have to look at the, at, the, at, the, at the Google map, you know, I, I, I mm -hmm. remember. Why? Because I trained my brain and I developed certain areas of my brain that remember those streets. 
without thinking about it. So that happens for everything. So if you if you keep if you are always sad, if you are with sad people and you overgrow, if you overdevelop this part of your brain, then you, you are more prone to sadness instead of if you develop certain areas of the brain, you, if you stimulate, if you, if you train that part of the brain that you know, make you happy because you stay with happy people, you have a, a, a positive attitude to life, over time, you are developing these areas. So what I'm trying to to explain in the book, you know, you know, what we are finding is that our emotions are very important with food and exercise in shaping our mental health, emotional health, intuitive, and our success in life. Because if we are happy, positive, healthy individuals, we're going to be better at work. We're going to be more creative. Uh, we're going to use our intuition. And to do that, you know, you have to train your brain. And so cognitive training is exactly that. In our medicine, you know, when you go to medical schools, there is nothing about it. You know, as, as doctors, we are trained to make diagnosis of disease that typically take many, many years to develop. So someone comes to me with, I have a pain in my joint. I have a pain in my chest. I have uh, blood in my urine. And so what I do, I do some exams, blood or, or imaging, and then I make a diagnosis and typically I prescribe drug or surgery. So that's how doctors are trained. And there is, and there is very little about the preventative to understand that many of these diseases develop because for many, many years, people, they had unhealthy lifestyle and also they use their brain in a, in, a, in, a, uh, in a negative way so that, you know, they develop negative emotions that in some way is influencing uh, inflammation, uh, uh, excessive catecholamine and cortisol activation. So it's, 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 it's a beautiful puzzle, as we said. Now, yeah. apart from cognitive training, then there is sleep. You know, what we are finding is that sleep is super, super important for our health. Sleeping well, sleeping deeply for, 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 for at least six, seven hours is very important, again, for preventing uh, uh, cognitive decline. There are beautiful studies published in science showing that not only in animals, but even in humans, if you don't sleep well, if, you sleep, uh, if your sleep is fragmented, you have deposition of beta amyloid and tau, these toxic proteins that are driving Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. And I think that it, I, as every industry across health has looked at it, sleep has become a, a more central player. I don't think it's been given enough attention um, in the past couple of decades, and I think that returning to it is good. You, in a lot of your work, you, you look at the blue zones. In particular, I've heard you speak about Okinawa, Centarians, um, and, uh, and these groups of people that are living past 100. And um, from a layperson's perspective who hasn't studied a lot of the statistics or um, the, the studies, you know, you get into this nature versus nurture, biology versus environment conversation with some of those communities. And I'm curious, because you have this um, systems analysis and model in place where you're looking at like at least eight different puzzle pieces to longevity, do you ascribe when you look at these blue zones, these areas, particularly in Okinawa and places like that, do you ascribe more biology factors or um, societal factors? to these pockets of people living past 100? It's a very difficult question. I think, you know, that, you know, you have to realize that it's very difficult, you know, for, 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 for us, you know, for scientists, you know, to understand really what's going on. And so we are trying to use different models. So we are using animal models because, you know, some of the experiments you can do in animals cannot be done in humans, as you can imagine, you know, for many, for several reasons. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but animals are not humans, as we already discussed. Then, you know, we have human studies and you have epidemiological studies like the Okinawans or other epidemiological studies where you can just, uh, 
you can just uh, define associations. So meaning that, you know, if you see, you know, someone is living longer and uh, uh, they are eating less or they are exercising more, you assume that that factor is responsible for the longevity or for less cancer or less cardiovascular disease, but it's just an association. It may be something else that is related to that factor that is responsible for that. Okay. And then, you know, you have clinical trials where, we, you know, the, the clinical trials, the randomized clinical trials are the gold standard, you know, for, for, for determining a cause effect relationship. But as you can imagine, you can now do a, a, a randomized clinical trial that lasts 20 years is impossible in humans for several reasons, costs uh, and compliance and many other factors. So what we are trying to do and what I try to do in the book is to combine the best evidence coming from animal models with uh, epidemiological data like the Okinawans or the Sardinians that are living longer and the, the, the randomized clinical trial and other studies as best as I could uh, and, uh, and uh, to, 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 to try to make sense of this very complicated but beautiful puzzle that is uh, uh, healthy aging, healthy longevity. But going back to your, your question, the data from these uh, uh, Okinawans or Sardinian centenarians are suggesting, and let me uh, state, I'm just saying suggesting, not demonstrating, mm -hmm. that there are multiple factors that are responsible for longevity in these individuals. Diet is an important component. In Okinawa and Sardinia, it looks like a, a mildly cut. So basically, what we are finding is that these pockets of centenarians living in Okinawa or in South Italy, um, they have certain characteristics. One is that their diet is mildly calorie restricted, so they, they eat a bit less of what a normal person eats. But another important characteristic of their diet is that it's mainly plant-based. It's not vegetarian, but it's mainly plant-based with complex carbohydrates, non-refined um, grains in South Italy instead of uh, sweet potatoes in, in, in Okinawa. Uh, tofu and beans in South Italy, lots of different types of vegetables, huge amount of fresh vegetables and uh, some fish and meat occasionally, no soft drinks, no sweets, not junk, refined processed food. Then, you know, another component of their lifestyle is it's exercise. They have a very active lifestyle. They are not, you know, doing marathons, but, you know, because they are, most of them, they were farmers or they were fishermen or, or, or they were, um, you know, people uh, dealing with animals. They, 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 they had a lot of physical activity. Another important component is their strong social uh, family interactions. So they were mm. big families supporting each other, you know, grandparents taking care of, uh, of their kids. And, uh, and, and, and so there was a lot of love and positive emotional uh, interactions. And then many of this culture, they have a, a strong spiritual basis, you know, so the spirituality uh, that is not religion, but spirituality is a very important component of 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 um, of this um, puzzle of these centenarians. Yeah, I'm curious. Um, we're running out of time, but I wanted to ask you one final question because you brought up uh, Walter Longau, and um, in uh, the USA, at least in the groups and the fasting communities that I speak to on a regular basis, both academic and lay, um, a lot of the people talk about his work with fast mimicking as being this flagship moment where people were actually starting to do um, the good science and applying it towards um, provable means, if you will, in the fasting communities. And I'm wondering, because you have uh, this connection with him over this documentary that was done and you've seen some of the 
um, at least some of the branding agencies and marketing efforts that can go behind this and how it furthers inquiry, which then can, of course, further funding and uh, into inquiry and things that actually change and move the scientific studies along. Um, what areas of fasting, in your professional opinion, need to be studied next in order to advance some of the um, connections and proper scientific correlations we can make on its behalf and in regards to um, health and longevity? Look, you know, I know Walter very well, you know, apart from the documentary, we wrote several articles together, you know, for example, we published in 2010 a science review article that is highly cited, you know, there's more than 2000 citation is a classic. And so I know him very well. And uh, his, his work in animals, it's very, very interesting. You know, the, the, the studies he did in, in mice with uh, the fasting, the prolonged fasting in cancer, in, in protecting uh, animals from the damage of chemotherapy, they are very, very interesting. And there are some new data in, in humans suggesting that this intervention could be important in, uh, in helping uh, people with, for example, breast cancer, women with breast cancer to have less damage when they have chemo. And so the data are very, very interesting. My problem is that Again, animals are not humans. So before we can prescribe intervention that can have positive effects in certain clinical situations, but can have detrimental effects in other situations, we have to be very, very careful. So that's my only concern with many, not only with fasting, but with many of these interventions that mm -hmm. uh, jumping from very interesting and promising data into humans can be very dangerous. Let me just make a couple of examples. So there was a scientist in Amgen. Amgen is a, is a California-based big uh, company, pharma company, technological company. Uh, there was a scientist who said, you know, look, you know, I want to study new... Uh, I want to translate some of the findings of some important animal studies uh, into potential human studies and, and, and new drugs. And so he took 50 papers published in Nature, Science, Cell, that are the three major uh, prestigious uh, scientific journals, and he tried to replicate those 50 papers. You know how many, how many papers he was able to replicate out of 50? five many? so 45 <laughs> were not he, he was not able to replicate these 45 uh, papers the, so set of data so just to tell you that you know we have to be very careful you know we don't understand why in different labs uh, the animals are responding to the same intervention in a different way. We don't have, you know, there are people suggesting the gut microbiota. So when animals, they are moving from one facility to another facility, the gut microbiota is different. And so the response is different. So we don't understand how it works. What I'm just trying to convey and what I said in my book is that animals are essential for generating hypotheses that must be tested in humans. We cannot translate yeast, worm, flies, and mice data into human intervention without testing them in humans for the positive and potential negative effects. Absolutely, I concur. And I think anyone who's trying to do that is, um, is set up for a scientific folly and a trail of tears um, from the human specter. Um, Luigi, I want to thank you so much for speaking with us today. We're out of time, but I appreciate you giving us all of your expertise and information regarding yourself as, um, as well as your book. I encourage everyone to go out and uh, pick up a copy. Uh, again, um, it's, uh, it's described as, in fact, I will read everyone really quickly if you'll give me uh, just one moment. 
as um, online, uh, it's described as an easy to follow comprehensive um, book that outlines a plan that integrates the principles of nutrition, diet, exercise, brain health, and um, mm, brain health. Brain health and relationships that can help you not only live a long life, but also also healthier and more fulfilling life. So, um, and the book title again, Dr. Luigi Fontana, can you uh, give us the title? Yes, it's The Path to Longevity, published by Hardy Grant. And then, you know, I have a YouTube channel where I try to do some videos where I explain, you know, some of this concept. And I also regularly post interesting articles that I read regularly on the major medical journals. And I think they are very important in my LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram and Twitter accounts. So if people, they want to follow, you know, the, the news about, you know, what I think there are important articles, scientific articles, uh, they can follow my socials. Wonderful. Thank you for giving us your time today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Absolutely. For everyone listening, we've been speaking with Professor Luigi Fontana. He is the professor of medicine and nutrition and an author. Uh, you can find out more, as you've, as he's mentioned, on YouTube as well as um, Facebook and by just by simply Googling his name. From all of us at Patricia Kathleen Podcast, thanks for listening. Remember to be responsible, practice compassion, and always bet on yourself. Sancha. Mm-hmm.